I've got a relatively interesting life in that I grew up overseas from the time I was about three years old till I was 15. So my father got into flying late in life, so we ended up being in Yokohama, Japan, where I went to a Japanese kindergarten. Then we lived in uh, Cairo, Egypt, then uh, Beirut, Lebanon, and then back to Tokyo, Japan, where I did most of my formative years where I kind of was in bands. The first music I was exposed to was actually, a lot of it was initially on what was called the Far East Network, which was the uh, military radio station. So along with kind of popular radio, I listened to that kind of stuff, which include things like the Carpenters, but the bands I was in with my friends was always something that uh, was more uh, like uh, Deep Purple or um, Black Sabbath and stuff like that. So I kind of have always walk this balance between what I say is the beautiful and the brutal. I was gonna say I didn't really pay attention to the sonics of most records, and I think that's accurate And until I started hearing Led Zeppelin and also Pink Floyd. Those things started to really influence me, like how they put those things together and what was the, uh, how did they achieve the aesthetic they were going for? So I started listening to those kind of things. So I was going to UC Berkeley and I had built this studio in my parents' garage and I was eager to work with other bands. So what I did is I made these flyers saying eight track recording, $12 an hour and had my phone number on it. And I went to all the places that bands rehearsed. And so I put these things up all over the place. And I, cause I just wanted to get some work. I couldn't afford to put any advertisements in the local magazine, so I, I just did it this way. And uh, this guy named Bill Gould, who was also going to Berkeley, uh, saw one of my flyers at one of those two record stores. And at the time, his band was called Sharp Young Men. And then they ultimately turned into Faith No Man. And I actually recorded their first single uh, that they ever put out as uh, Faith No Man. And I recorded that in my parents' garage. And that included Bill Gould, the bass player, and Mike Borden, the drummer, who ultimately went on to become Faith No More. But they had a different singer and a different keyboard player. While I was working with them, they had played a show at a place called The Sound of Music in like the sketchy, sketchy Tenderloin district of uh, San Francisco. And in the middle of their show, Wade Worthington, their original keyboard player, left the band and then and a guy named Roddy Bottom walked in and he became the keyboard player. So then that's Bill Gould, Mike Borden and Roddy Bottom who formed ultimately Faith No Man and then it became Faith No More after they uh, left their singer and got a new guitar player, a new, new uh, singer. So after that they got signed to Slash Records and, and really uh, fortunate for me and very kind on their end, they actually had me come along with them. I didn't know that they were gonna part ways with Chuck. He was probably as afraid of failure as of success, and I think sometimes guaranteed it by his actions at times. Uh, and and uh, anyway, things fell apart, and so they were without a singer. I mean, Patton was certainly a revelation, I think, for the band. I mean, he actually, we knew we were looking for a singer, and I had put out feelers to try to uh, find somebody, but Jim Martin somehow had heard Mr. Bungle, and so he's the one who ultimately got Patton in there, but I was also somehow like probably a week or two behind him trying to find who this Patton guy was. And um, there was about a two week period. He came into San Francisco from Eureka and we had the music, he had the, he had the songs and he wrote all the lyrics and he wrote all the melodies for all of those songs within a two week period. And because the, song, the music was already established, when he would say to the guys, can we make this section longer, that section shorter, he, the band would say, no, you gotta just write the way it is. And so he actually took all his stuff and he fit it into this is existing music. So to me, the, the thing about that band that is unique that I, I think was really inspiring is that it felt to me like a, like a four or five armed web, uh, a spider web, that each guy was pulling in equal and opposite directions. And that dynamic tension of one guy wanting to make a, like basically make a metal record, but the other guy was pulling and saying, I want to make a pop record. The one guy was saying, I want to play this African rhythm. And then the other guy's like, well, here's some melodic keyboard stuff. And because there was that, that energy pulling out from the center and no one person was able to say, I'm the leader of this band. We're going to go in this direction. That's what made it so um, eclectic and unique and alive. And, and this, this record, the real thing was the record that people were knocking on my door like never, never before. I mean, it was really something. So it really felt good, like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I and mean, that's the first time I felt like I knew what I was doing, especially after mastering it and thinking I didn't know what I was doing and I thought I sucked as an engineer and a producer and a mixer and to feel really bad about my abilities and to almost quit. And then to get gold and platinum records with this band is the best thing. I mean, I, I've worked with other people that have had the, kind of, that kind of success, but with them, we really grew up together. And you know, two of these guys started my parents' garage with me when I was doing an eight track, and so that's really fulfilling.
Okay, From Out of Nowhere, that's the first song on the record. It's interesting, you know, that's, that's my least favorite song on the record, um, mainly because I felt like that was a song that wasn't quite fully developed. And they do that kind of verse, and then what feels like a chorus is actually, to me, always felt like a pre-chorus, and I don't think they actually get to a real chorus till almost like two and a half minutes in, there's another section. And because I'm kind of a pop guy and I always kind of try to push in that direction, even if there's like a heavy rock band, I really want to get to the good stuff sooner. So I think that was one of the things I didn't particularly like about that song. But it was the lead off single. It got people kind of interested and it did set the stage very, very nicely for what came after that. For me, that was always, it was always a challenge uh, to, it was always a challenge mixing this band because I felt like it, each member was playing at 100%. So to me, as a, as a mixer, it was always very, very difficult to try to carve little spaces for everything to be heard. I remember the guitars, you know, Jim Martin always wanted the guitars louder, but I, I wanted to hear what Roddy was doing, you know, and the drums were kind of busy, and the bass is actually pretty busy too. So for me, it was just a challenge. So fortunately, Roddy got this new uh, Emacs keyboard and it had some really cool sounds on it. Again, he just had a good idea. Of, he, he played a lot of the hooky parts of, of, I think, this record are his keyboards. He had the hooky parts because, um, Jim Martin certainly was more muscle and weight and Roddy was able to kind of come up with some parts that I think caught people's ears. Uh, so this is an interesting, one of the interesting things about this song is that when you hear Mike Patton sing the chorus, he goes, you want it all. And it sounds like he's flat most of the time and he doesn't quite get to the note and he's just like, he's kind of lackadaisical. So I'd stop the tape and then he would just, and I'd go, why can't you just go, you want it all, but, and I just wanted to land on the notes and he just said, no, I'm not gonna do that. He sang in a way, and that sense of yearning getting to the notes is really essential to making that song work. Uh, you can hear Mike Borden's drumming. Again, it's that really solid tribal stuff with him and Billy playing. No guitars even in the, in the verses at all. It's just voice, drums, and guitars. So keyboards come in the chorus, and then there's the uh, guitars in the chorus. And of course, the song has the instrumental section that's 45 seconds of drums are kind of going off, playing their thing. Bill, the bass player, is playing all kinds of melodic stuff. He's not even holding down the low end. And Jim Martin is playing probably four or five different guitar parts in that section. So again, very, very well put together track. Uh, again, Bill Gould envisioned it. I, I, I just helped capture it. Well, for me, I mean, I, at that time, uh, I wasn't, I think the only thing I knew about that time in rap was probably Grandmaster Flash's The Message, which was I felt was a groundbreaking song. But to me, the, the fact that the band was able to join these two different uh, kind of worlds into one thing I thought was really groundbreaking and I wish I could say I had something to do with it but I was just there as a person to capture it and be there to support them but it was really Patton came up with this stuff the band came up with the things and I really was just like their their champion I would be the one who would say hey maybe we can shorten this section or try some ideas here and there but it was really them and I was you know and then when the band said we had we made a pop record I'm like well you know not this kind of music had never been heard on radio before that and so it was a big, big leap of faith and it, it somehow, they were right. I mean, they were right. I think what, I think the Faith No More knew that their audience was out there and they went and found every single person with every tour and every time someone watched this stuff on MTV or heard on the radio, they actually, they actually brought their audience to them and that's I think what they did. So. I think we just followed our guts. I think this was one of those records where we just did what we wanted to do. Those guys were so, uh, you know, they just kind of followed their own muse anyway, so they just did what they wanted. And I think that was a, the perfect storm of them doing exactly what they wanted to do. I was able to support them and help them realize their goal and their vision. And we were able to, to make a record that we liked.
Gorgeous. Um, yeah, so if you're listening in stereo, on the left-hand side is Bill Gould playing those chords. It's on an Emacs, so it sounds kind of clunky. It, uh, the Emacs was an early sampler, and so the piano samples were a little sketchy. And it's interesting, if you listen to the way he plays it, he's actually flamming some of the notes, which is kind of what Mike Borden did with the snare drum. And so he's doing that, and Roddy Bottom is on the right-hand side on a nice grand piano playing the more melodic part. And so it's really interesting to hear those two things, because one is really clunky, like this is probably like 8-bit sampling, so it's kind of sketchy sounding, and it's played kind of, you know, hard. And then Roddy's got this beautiful thing. To me, that's almost the bookends of, of this band and this album, is that one's harder, grittier, not very refined, and one is very elegaic and graceful and, and beautiful. And to me, that's where this, this band lives between those two extremes. And once again, this was in Bill's four-track demo. I, I mean, I really, I, I just, I, I can't, I, I, I would love to take credit for so much of this stuff, but he had this on his demo, and that's, so he ended up playing that, the, the one side, the left-hand side, and Roddy played the other side, but it was, it was really him. Bill, Bill did it. Love that song. If if I were king of the universe, I'd probably have a whole album like that. Uh, to me, that's that's kind of like if I was a, if I was actually in faith no more. That's the kind of stuff I would do because to me that was the best blend of like really muscular guitars, but really melodic keyboard parts. It's also kind of funky. And by the way, I think this is one of the more honest lyrics on the record because to me, I haven't asked Mike about this, but I'm pretty sure. It's about the fact that he's torn between his band Mr. Bungle and this band Faith No More. And this whole indecision is the fact that he's stuck between two places. And I think that lyrically that really supports that aesthetic. And I, I just love that track. Jim is a very, very unique individual. But the one thing I want to say about him is that he brought the muscle to the band, which the band really, truly needed. The, the weight and the heft that he brought balanced out a band that could have easily teetered into you know, pop or some other kind of music, but he really brought this weight that was really essential. One of the interesting things about The Real Thing is that when we made that record, we had one Gibson Flying V and we had one Marshall Half Stack. So that's what we did to get that sound. And to be fair, with Jim and all musicians, I believe, and a lot of people will argue against this, I believe that 80, 85% of the sound is from, from wrists, fingertips, and vocal cords. And I think all I'm trying to do is not get in the way and try to capture it. But I really think it's the way he played the guitar. It's, I think it's the way, that's really what contributed that sound, the way his wrist and the way he kind of held onto the guitar. Another thing that a lot of people don't know about making that, the guitar recording on that record is that there was an aesthetic that we approached that was started from even before recording. And so this is gonna sound kind of squirrely, but the day we started recording the guitars, there's the theme for the good, the bad, the ugly, which was done by Ineo, Ineo Morricone. And the very first day we, we put the cassette in there and we, and we push play and we turn the speakers all the way up and we played the good, the bad, the ugly theme. And Jim Martin, myself, and James watts Variki, our assistant, we stood there. It was brutally loud, uncomfortably loud, but we would salute the speakers 
And then at the end of the song, we would salute each other and then we started recording guitar. And I think as weird as that is, that energy and vibe carried through the guitar recording. Everything we did had to have that essence of grandeur and power. Nothing we did ever sounded like the good, the bad, the ugly in, in terms of sonics, but, but the feeling of that kind of panoramic, cinematic, deep, weighted, muscly sound we got because of that. Love that song. I think with Faith No More, you know, in their minds they thought they were a pop band, and yes, sometimes they were. Like maybe about a fifth of the time they were a pop band, but then a fifth of the time they were. A, this is like a thrash metal, you know, blistering, brutal sonic assault, you know, and, and that's where the band lived. And it's hard to remember what the mics are on this record because it's so long ago. But uh, I'm, I want to say that it was probably something like a, an AKG 414 because I knew I wanted a microphone that was a large diaphragm condenser to catch all of Patton's energy, and, um, and so to me that was really important. I knew a tube mic would fold under his power because he could sing very, very loud. To me, I was a, big, I was a really big fan of the, the music that that band made. Always, I just loved the power and the fury of what they had because they were a really unique band in that Mike Borden like, listened to jazz, but he also studied like, African rhythms while he was at UC Berkeley. And Bill Gould, I, I'm not sure his background, but he was playing bass, and. I think he was into Killing Joke, and Roddy was, it was actually a classically trained pianist. So you have all these, and Jim Martin was just like Mr. Heavy, Heavy Guitar, and he was, I know he was raised on like Black Sabbath and Corrosion of Conformity and Metallica. And if I had like a life or death situation where I had to like drive a car really fast or fly an airplane or something, I'd want that song playing. Like in like the last few minutes of my life, I'd be like, fuck yeah, man, that's a great song. I think that's gonna probably be in my top two favorite songs on this record. I, I think lyrically, I'm still to this day surprised how Patton wrote these lyrics for the whole album, but this song in particular, if you really listen to it, 
is ridiculously well written. And there's just so much about the human condition in this song and put it to music and the way the band supported him with the, the power and also, he also modulates his voice where he sings super, super powerful, but also super melodic and beautifully. I, mean, I think this song is just, um, I mean, to me that's, that's soul music. This is the kind of song that can go from entertainment to being essential, where if you really listen, and I think that the song can speak to people who really need to hear these lyrics at a certain time. I mean, I think it's, I love that song. I will say that what's interesting about this band and me recording the vocals, and this is gonna sound like anathema to anybody who is interested in high fidelity. But so I had Mike Patton with the, with the 414 microphone, but I ran it through a DBX-166, which is a dual compressor. I ran it into one side of the compressor as a compressor, and then I put it into the other side of the compressor as a limiter and then to tape. So a lot of people would argue that that's really not a good way to do it. I could have used other pieces of gear. But to make it worse, when I was mixing the record, I took his voice and I ran it through one side of that compressor as a, as a compressor, one side as a limiter, and then it went into the mix, and then we had the bus compressor. So there's a lot of compression going on, and Patton brought it. I mean, I, I really think that this record, for me, is, is a once-in-a-career perfect, perfect amalgamation of everything that all five guys came to at that point in time, and it just coalesced, and it was just absolutely Perfect, powerful, brutal, beautiful, melodic, everything I think we, we got. And I think that song for me is the, is the pinnacle of it. Jim really wanted to get the guitar sounds right. And so what we did is we set up his Marshall half stack and I put about 26 different microphones around the room. And we got this police tape to you know say, don't anyone walk around it. And so we had this tape and then we would move the mics and we spent a day moving and setting mics. And so I had it where the mics were on, a, on, a, on a, the faders of the, of the uh, console, eventually we whittled it down to about 12 or 14. But I knew that one mic would bring low frequency, one would bring mid-range presence, one would bring high end. I had some that were close, I had some that were far away. And um, the idea was to record the, the guitars without any equalization, which is what we did. And so to me, when I worked with Jim, we would just go, okay, wh what do we want more of? Like, and I would have mics on the back of the cabinet, mics you know, in the center of the cone, mics 10 feet away. So that's what we did to get that sound. So Bill Gould, as the bass player, is really the secret engine that drives Faith No More. He's the guy that initially wanted to record the band and he came to my studio and we did his early demos. He's the guy that is always pushing to um, create the songs and, and the whole idea. And in, he's the guy who would be there every day during the recording for the most part. So he's the guy that, uh, and he also has a very singular, unique, bass sound because one, he was playing this Gibson Grabber bass, but it was through a uh, PV guitar head and then we had it in a hallway. So when you when he plays the bass, you could hear some kind of ambience. So when he hit, because he would play with, he, he has got a really strong wrist and he really digs in. And there's a bit of distortion on the bass, but then you hear the room sound and that's part of the Faith No More sound. You know, it's really refreshing because I haven't listened to any of my records. I don't sit down and listen to uh, uh, pretty, pretty rarely, so it's really nice to listen to them. It's like I get to listen to it. The longer I wait, I get to listen to this music as a fan. Like, I wasn't even involved in it. I can actually just listen to it and enjoy it, which I couldn't do for probably 15 years after I worked on it. So now to listen to it and go, wow, that was really good. We did a good job. I think I downplayed it for such a long time and didn't want to you know, admit that 
you know, I did anything right or something back then. I don't know what it was, but I mean, just to listen and go, yeah, we, we, we got a lot of things right. For me, that was probably the pinnacle of my career in terms of having people, having me being visible and wanting to work with me because when that record hit, somehow people found my home number because I was having bands call me at my home, like, oh my goodness, how'd you get my number here? They were, that, that it, it was such a groundswell of, of, of excitement behind that record that they, people sought me out to work with them. I think that the thing that made it work for, for the guys at Faith No More and myself is that I think we trusted each other. You know, we, I think we did things for the right reasons. I think that this record was one of the few records, well, not few, but one of the records that the band and I just did it for the right reasons. We did not expect any kind of success. We certainly didn't expect it to blow up. It never occurred to us to, that that would happen, at least to me. They thought it was a pop record, but I, I didn't, you know, I was hopeful, but I think there's an honesty to that record that that was palpable, and I think people heard it and listened to it, and they go, oh, these guys mean it, you know, and I, I think there was, there's no artifice on the record, there's nothing, there's no false notes, I think it's all genuine, even our missteps, you know, I think because we were honest, that's why it's, it's was so successful. The thing I like about, that I still love about making records is that you can be in a room with somebody at the moment of creation and there are still, there's still people out there making amazing, incredible, inspiring music that is still essential and that moves me and that I feel the world has to listen to or has to hear. They have to hear, they have to listen to it, but they have to hear it. And, and I think that music at its very base level is entertainment but in the right circumstance with the right lyric at the right moment, I think it's essential and I've heard this from enough people that certain songs have had people decide to live another day. <laughs> That's, that, that has actually happened. And, and, and to be part of that is, is incredible. You know, it's, 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 it's unexpected and it's incredible to be a part of something that, that can, that somebody will actually go, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna, stick around one more day because of this song or this band or whatever. And I'm not saying that's just the stuff I worked on. There's a lot of stuff that other people have done that, that, it, that does that for me and does that for so many people. And I think music can be so essential in the right, the right moment, the right time that can really keep someone alive and keep them going. I think that's fantastic, you know? I think it's amazing. <laughs>